Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to feast on your word, and yet keenly aware of how little we know. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us, filtering out the foolishness and the ignorance that may be spoken, but opening our hearts and our minds to the truth, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the book of Revelation, and in our last study, we had come to chapter 5. I pointed out how that I believe uh, that we are seen in heaven and we're now seeing God dealing with His covenants and His promises to the nation Israel. John did see around the throne 24 other thrones upon which he saw 24 elders. So it's possible to conclude that they're, they're a picture of the church. That may not be your position. That's the position of this ministry. And that would jive, I believe, with possibly John being a sign of the rapture. We also know that John tries to describe in language that, that he can what he saw there. And it looks like a picture of God and the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ that are, that are around that throne with four living creatures. Now, whether they represent the cherubim, that's up to you. But what we know is that there were four living creatures who had eyes both in the front and the back And these living creatures who had eyes both in the front and the back, uh, they look like a lion, a calf, or not, or ox, a man, and an eagle. And I suggested that these living creatures most likely represent God's covenant and His administration of those four areas of, of His creation which I believe coincides with some of the comments in the Old Testament. And they don't rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And some have suggested that the Holy, 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 the reason it's three, uh, because it's God the Father, uh, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But there's constant praise something that mankind's always been unwilling to do. But at least the hosts of heaven are constantly praising God and pointing out that it is God who lives forever and ever. These, these 24 elders, then, that they fall down uh, before the one sitting on the throne, and they worship Him, the one that lives from the ages to the ages, and they throw their crowns before the throne. Now, I suggested, uh, I believe I did in an earlier study, that we have no indication in any place that angels are ever crowned, which seems to be one of the possible indications that these 24 are not angels, but that they represent the church. I think they're the church, and that's the way that I would teach it. To my knowledge, angels have never been called elders. They... Uh, they cast their crowns before Him and they worship Him and they say, you're worthy to receive the glory and the honor and the power because you created all things. And by means of your will, they exist and were created. And we know from the book of Hebrews that it's the Lord Jesus Christ who created all things. If you followed us through our study in Ephesians, you, you, you may remember that He is the creator of all things that he holds them all to get hold all, he holds all things together. Uh, I'm not I'm not anywhere close to being able. Uh, I'm not I'm not capable of teaching a physics class. But what I do know is that our four forces, uh, which is that it's an interesting number four, they're uh, they're uh, electromagnetic gravity, uh, strong nuclear force and weak. Uh, nuclear force 
And that strong nuclear force is what holds creation together, or the nucleus would fly apart. I don't have any problem at all with Christ holding it together by His will, His pleasure. He's the one, He's the only one who's worthy to receive all of the glory, the honor, and the power because He created everything. That means that there isn't any uncreated thing except God. God was at the beginning of time, but He also created time. So uh, uh, we have this tendency to take and put God in a box or confine Him in, in terms of time or, or try to define Him in terms of time. I believe that God is timelessness. We can't put God in a time frame. If you put God in a time frame, then He's not God. We limit God, and, and, he, and so therefore He can't exist. So God is timeless. And one of the things that He created was the new creation. Not just the created order of everything, the universe and everything that's in it, but He also created us as new creations. We are His new creation we didn't we didn't we didn't cause that to come about of our of our own will or of or because of our own pleasure and that's what these elders whoever you make them out to be that's what they're saying as they cast their crowns before them. there was no merit in, in their minds uh, there was no merit involved they had nothing to do with it and no angels had anything to do with it. So, not the cherubim, not the four living creatures, none of these created beings had anything to do with our being made a new creation in Christ. Yes, there are ministering spirits, those angels, but they didn't, they, they ministered the truth of God's Word, which brought about effectual change in our lives, which made us new creations in Christ. It was God and God alone who is absolutely worthy to receive all the glory, the honor, and the power, the praise, and, and on and on and on that goes. And that is what we will do, every single one of God's children will do someday, whether they're doing that now or not. I wanted to, to emphasize that point, uh, and it, it was one of the, the main uh, purposes of this video was to, I, I don't think we can under-emphasize the point that we reserve no honor, no glory, no praise for, for ourselves. We don't reserve any, anything, any merit, anything for ourselves. Constantly, over and over in Scripture, we read that it all belongs to Him. And yet, you would know that uh, when looking at much of modern Christianity today. It was God and God alone who is absolutely worthy to receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. So John goes on with what he saw in heaven. And I don't know how far we'll get today in chapter 5. But I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. And you could easily translate that a little book or a little scroll written on both sides. And it was sealed with seven seals. Now, I spent some time discussing this passage with Sue and some of my thoughts concerning this scroll. And so I'd like for you to listen to what I told Sue earlier today concerning this scroll. So in looking at the scroll, and the word scroll is the word uh, biblion in the Greek, it's the word for book. There are a lot of views as to, well, there a lot of questions arise uh, concerning this scroll. One of the questions that people would normally ask would be, uh, one of the primary questions would be, what is in the book? What does the scroll contain? There are also other questions concerning why was it written on both sides, how was it sealed, 
Some suggest that it was a rolled up or that all seven seals were on the outer edge of the rolled up scroll. There's another view that, that, that suggests that no, it wasn't, you didn't see the seven seals on the outside of the scroll along one edge, but that you, you would only see, if you were to look upon the book, you'd only see one scroll or, or one seal. You would only see one seal on the outer edge. And as you opened that one seal, it would unroll a ways and that, or that there would be the, another seal in which you would open and then unroll it and then there would be another seal and so on and so forth until the entire scroll was unrolled. Why was it written on the inside and the outside both? That, that's another question. Another question is, is why did John weep when no man was found to open the scroll? You would think that, that, that John would have known that, that Christ's work was sufficient, that he was the Lamb of God, that he was the only one worthy. You know, you, it would be ridiculous, I think, to suggest that the reason that he cried was, that, was because no man was able to open the scroll because John would have perfectly known that no man was worthy to open the scroll, if you know what I'm saying. So those are some of the questions. Now, many suggestions have been made as to what the content of the scroll was. Now, some say that suggest that it was a copy of the Torah, the law. Uh, I find that difficult to 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 pers to conceive of primarily because the the law was was never sealed. You know how they could suggest that the content of the scroll is the law or a copy of the law just doesn't seem to fit the the picture or the content or the context. Another suggestion has been made is that it's a divorce agreement with Israel. Uh, Israel was set aside. Uh, uh, God, Jehovah, the, the wife of Israel, uh, because Israel was set aside so that salvation could come to the Gentiles. So it's a divorce document with Israel, which is about to be judged along with the nations during the, that period that's, that we see as the day of the Lord. That's another suggestion. Another suggestion that, that one other suggestion that I'm aware of is, is that it was a sort of a nuptial agreement between Christ and the church, the new Jerusalem, and that sort of thing. That doesn't seem to fit the context. Uh, there's, I suppose, the most common uh, way of looking at it. The most accepted view is, is that they are, it, it's, it is simply what it is. It's the seal judgments that we read about uh, from chapter 6 1 to 8 1 before we see the trumpet judgments begin. So, What's contained in the book is the seal judgments and that they occur one after another in succession as each seal is opened. That's, that's, that's one view. Another view is, is that none of the events contained within the seals that occur, that they, none of them can occur until all seven seals are opened. Okay? That's another view. So... It's, I, uh, I don't want my viewers, my listeners, to be so confounded by all these different views that, that they just basically say, okay, well, you know, this is so complicated, I'm just going to have to leave this to the experts. Well, first of all, I think it's of primary importance that we could at least consider spend some a moment thinking about the fact that that our God is not a God of confusion. I don't think that he has so constructed the word of God or designed the word of God where that only only those that select few of 
you know, specially learned, highly trained experts or Bible scholars or, or specially gifted Christians can understand it. I'm of the mind that the Holy Spirit can, can enlighten every single believer to the truth of the Word of God, no matter what their status. And so, based upon that, I think that, the, and I hate to bring in something like Occam's Razor, but Occam's Razor basically states that the, the most simple answer is probably the most obvious. And to me, the most obvious is, is that, and this is probably the position I'm going to take on this, is that the contents of the scroll itself is the book of Revelation itself. The entire book of Revelation. Now, when we get to the end of the book, I believe in chapter 21 or 22, Jesus tells John to not seal up the prophecy of this book. But you got to remember that John was in a vision. He, he did, after the vision was completed, he did find himself back because he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So he found himself back. On, he, he never left the Isle of Patmos where the book was, of Revelation was being written. He never bodily left, okay? It was a vision. Now, do I believe that that we see the church in heaven in chapter 4? Yes, I do. But, so, what I'm going to suggest here, and I don't ask anybody to agree with me, is that John, of course, any time God commands some, any one of his people to do anything, they're going to do it. Did John obey the Lord when the Lord said, do not seal up the prophecy, the words of this book? And he's, and he's speaking of the book of Revelation. Same word, biblion in the Greek. Well, I, I think it'd be foolish to suggest that John disobeyed Christ and sealed up the words of the, of the prophecy of this book. They were not sealed, just as Jesus told him not to seal up those words. They were, they were not sealed because at the time that the book was written, in 95, 96 A.D., somewhere thereabouts, the book was, was, was then distributed to the churches. Now, contained within the book of Revelation was the seven letters, which was made available for reading and study, okay, to all the churches and rather than each church receiving its own letter I believe what they received was the book of Revelation in which they received all the letters to all the churches in which there was doctrinal truth contained within those letters that pertained to each one of the seven churches there's, there's no way that uh, the church at, at, at uh, Philadelphia could say well what you said about the church of Laodicea, that's not true of me, of, of us. That there was application in all seven letters to all seven churches. And so they received not just the letters to the churches, but they received the entire book of Revelation. So the book in that sense was not sealed up. It's, it may be a little bit confusing to see the Lord say to John at the end of the, of the book of Revelation to not seal up the words of this book. But it makes every bit of sense to me for him to say that given the fact that John was in a vision and so he didn't seal up the words of the prophecy of that book. So now we see John in heaven and Jesus is... is the only one who's worthy to open the, the seals. So what do the seals represent? Now, whether you, you want to look at it as, as, as far as how the, the, the book was sealed, I think is, is, I wouldn't spend too much time thinking about that. 
but uh, it's you know whether the seals were all seven were seen on the outside or whether the you know it was sealed all the way through but the the point I guess that I want to try to make here and I'm probably not going to do a very good job of it is w what I would suggest is is that there's there was no way that the events that we see unfold in the book of Re Revelation could occur until after the church was gone which explains why the book was sealed. We see the book sealed, but it wasn't sealed in the sense that we don't have the book of Revelation and that the church hasn't had the book of Revelation since the beginning, since the time it was written. The seals is not saying, the seven seals is not saying that, that this is something that we can't understand Okay, until the seals are opened. Because we actually can pick up a, a copy of the Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, see the seals open, and see what occurs. You follow what I'm saying? So the seals represent the fact that none of that could occur until after the church is gone. Which, which is also, I, I believe, just another proof of the fact that the day of the Lord will not occur cannot occur until after the church is gone the day of the lord being a term that's used over 90 times in the old testament to describe a period which begins with the uh after the church is gone and, and it's and it, it's a period that extends all the way through the tribulation period all the way through the thousand year reign of christ and perhaps even beyond. That's the day of the Lord. We are not in the day of the Lord right now. But John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was not there in heaven. Except in the spirit. He, he continued to, to, uh, he remained, to remain on the Isle of Patmos until, until his death. It, he, he wasn't. Uh, physically there is in the sense that we will be there after the rapture takes place. And so what he saw was no man was able to open up that book. In fact, the, the text actually states that no man was able to even look upon it. And so it's, there's a lot of interesting things going on here, but what I would, what I would suggest is that people at least give some thought to the idea that what was contained within the scroll, the book, Biblion in the Greek, was in fact and is in fact the book of Revelation itself. And furthermore, John could not have written what he did in Revelation until he had seen the vision. Now, as far as the scroll being written on the inside and the outside both, it's, it's quite possible that what was written on the inside as the seals were, were broken were, is the revelation that we see from chapter 6-1 to 8-1 before we, we see the, the, tr uh, the trumpet judgments mentioned. And so uh, as the seals were opened, uh, and, and of course as you would open the seals, you would... It would be the inside that you would be reading, the inside, what was written on the inside of the scroll. That describes the seven seals and what we see in the seven seals. But the out, so the, I, I would suggest that perhaps what was written on the outside was the rest of the entire book of Revelation that was written uh, from chapter 8-1 with the beginning of the trumpet judgments all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation. So that's what I told Sue. And... Uh, that's pretty much my position on this. Some believe that all all seven have to be broken before you can read anything, you know, if it was rolled up with seven seals along the edge, or you'd have to break all seven before you could read anything. You know, maybe you could read a few words around the edge before you broke the seal. And that's one picture that people have in their minds. And the other picture, I think the more likely 
uh, picture is is that uh, it was rolled up a ways and the seal was put on the edge and then it was rolled up some more and a wax seal was put on the edge so so that when you break a seal you can unroll it to the next one so I think it was rolled up a ways and sealed and rolled up further and sealed seven times so that you can break a seal and read part of it but that doesn't make that true uh, you need to think about these things yourselves and, and draw your own conclusions. I'm just putting my ideas on this out here for you to think about. So, uh, there's, and there's a big argument as to what this scroll is. You know, the normal, I think, uh, seminary conclusion, I believe, is, is that it's a title deed that Christ purchased the earth and Israel and the, the church by the shedding of his blood. And, and this is his title deed. Well, that's a funny title deed. You know, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe it's a title deed. It could be the same scroll. I, I suppose that Daniel saw in the 12th chapter of Daniel and that he longed to read. And the same thing that the prophets longed to read. And as Peter says, that the angels longed to look into. And so that's, that's what God has sealed up. If you want to take that view, uh, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, what he's promised is judgment, but I believe it's the book of Revelation itself. That's the position I'm going to take. The Old Testament is full of the fact that God is going to judge, and it's all centered in Israel. The judgment for us as the church is an accounting of our work, singular. That's not works, plural, but work singular. What? In other words, what does the work of your life as a whole represent? What does it look like? You know, essentially a total composition that, that uh, of in, in looked at in the whole, did it bring glory and honor to the Lord, or did it look like what? Uh, did it look like uh, hay wood stubble? But it's not individual activities. Uh, the sin issue has been settled. God has cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. He's buried in the depths of the sea. He says to be remembered no more. Now, I don't think we, you know, we don't look at Paul and say, you know, boy, man, he really persecuted the church. And, you know, he was consenting to the death of Stephen. So God's going to weigh all of that against all the good stuff that Paul did. And if it, if the scales, you know, come out in Paul's favor, well, you know, then he's good, and if they don't, he's, he's bad. And, you know, so God's going to look at the life of Paul and see what it looked like uh, uh, in, in all of its individual parts, and he's going to uh, judge Paul and you and me based upon all of that stuff. And, uh, folks, that, I don't see that in Scripture. And, and just looking at the, the, the judgment seat of Christ itself, it's our work singular it's how we built on christ not the flesh not the law but how we built on christ so as far as the judgment for the believer is concerned that's where we stand but we're looking at uh, 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 a different judgment here there is a judgment for israel that's clearly portrayed in prophetic scripture because of their forsaking god's promises and covenants and this is a book that was really written about the judgments that God has in store for the nation Israel and for those who have made the earth their place of permanent abode. It's, it's what Daniel wanted to see and what Daniel wanted to read and what Daniel wanted to proclaim. And God said to seal it up until the last day. And it's, and it's tempting to... to I, I, I quite understand the fact that it's tempting to see that... that uh, the similarity between Daniel and John here and the sealing up of this book. Uh, I'm not so sure that, that that's the case. Uh, I believe that, that Daniel was given revelation concerning uh, how, how certain things were going to unfold during the tribulation period as it referred to the Antichrist and the, the, the latter half of the Great Tribulation leading up to the Kingdom but I do not believe that by any means that, that what uh, Daniel was told to seal up was the book of Revelation, and that's what we're looking at.
and I saw a strong angel. The text says, well, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I thought all angels were strong. So, I mean, so maybe there's weaker angels and stronger angels. Actually, I think the preferred word would be mighty. I saw a mighty angel who was proclaiming with a mighty voice, who was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Apparently, John, he, he's as interested as the angels and as, and as Daniel was, and as the prophets were to look into what God had, had determined for judgment. And so John is just as interested. In fact, he's extremely interested, and I want you to remember that he's in a vision, okay? He does find himself back on the Isle of Patmos, okay? Uh, we need to make that distinction, of, you know, between, you know, you know, one minute he's in this vision, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day, and then, but, but after that vision has has been complete, after that vision ends, you know, he's uh, he's back on the Isle of Patmos, the the Book of Revelation having been written. Uh, I don't know how much sense I'm making here with this, but uh, uh, and well, so no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Okay, now you could say, well, that what that means is, that means that the, the serious understanding of the exact plans of God concerning judgment have not been open and available until this moment, a point after which we, were, we are gone. Well, I have a little trouble with that because we have the book of Revelation today, and we can look at it, as did the seven churches. You know, nor could these things occur until after the seals are open, which is after we are gone. We know the judgment on the world and the nation of Israel. We know, folks, we know it's coming. We know that God has promised a judgment. And, and I am not in any way suggesting I never have, and you won't find a video where I've ever suggested that you as a new creation in Christ Jesus, that you face that judgment. I think that we're beyond that point here, even in our study here, that we are no longer here. The church has been caught up into heaven, at least in John's vision, and the day of the Lord has begun. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. There's, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. One of the primary reasons why we don't enter into Jacob's, the time of Jacob's trouble or the, the 70th week of Daniel is because we, have, we serve no purpose there. Even the ministry of the Holy Spirit through us is it would be in conflict with the ministry through the two witnesses, which concerns the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the age of grace, which we now preach. We have no place inside Daniel's 70th week. But there is a judgment coming and we cannot begin to even really comprehend the true nature of it. We can read it about it in the book of Revelation. Uh, we know it's severe. We know just how bad it, uh, a time that that's going to be. But I don't believe that any of us can fully comprehend uh, those judgments. God is going to judge this world. He's going to judge the nation Israel. He's going to judge the Gentiles who had sovereignty over the nation of Israel and, and who have the nations who have determined that the, this earth is the center of all things. Okay? So the book was sealed up, not worthy to open the seals. No man was worthy. It's interesting. We're not even able to look there upon that book. John, the word in the text indicates that no man was able to even look upon the book. And yet we're, we're looking upon the book of Revelation. And yet I'm suggesting that the scroll is the book of Revelation. Now maybe that might take a little more explaining, but, but that's the position that I've got to take on, on, on this at this point, at least at, at this point. Uh, John says he wept much because no man, absolutely no man, it's, it's who may in the Greek, absolutely no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Couldn't even look at it. 
not there therein. The text doesn't say therein. It says thereon. To physically look upon it is what the Greek says. You know, and, and I, I really hardly know what to say about why John wept. I mean, why didn't he know that only Christ was worthy to open the seals? You know, like, like I'm, right, I'm right in there with Daniel and, and the prophets and the angels. I, I, you know, uh, folks, what I read there is that John really wanted to know. Okay, I want to know. I'd want to know if I was John there. Okay. I believe now we do know, okay? But John really wanted to know what was in that book. I don't think that he realized that what was in that book, that scroll, the, bib, the word biblion in the Greek was exactly what he had written on the Isle of Patmos. I, I think that many of you would like to know. You'd like to know what the book says. And, but I believe that you do now. Now you do. When we get to what, what's interesting is when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we see Jesus telling John to not seal up the prophecy of this book. So did he do what the Lord commanded and not seal up the prophecy? I believe he did. Because if he had, we wouldn't we wouldn't have the book. So uh, you would think that he he would have known that Christ was the only one worthy to open the seal. You know, that, that he wasn't standing there in his own merit. Okay? You know, uh, he didn't say, well, look, I know one who's worthy to open it and read it. He didn't say that. So he weeps. And why does he weep? Well, in my mind, there's only one answer to that question. I'm persuaded it was because modern man has virtually ruled God out of the picture. Man who says, you know, we're, we're going to chart our own destiny. We're the the captain of our own, you know, fate. Uh, we're our own. We're going to chart our own course, and we're going to win. And and I think John knew that Christ's work was sufficient. I think that he knew that he was worthy to open that scroll. If that scroll is a title deed to the creation, I don't suppose he'd really be as interested to know what was in it, or to weep because no man can open and read it. But if that really is a revelation of the Word of God and what He's planned regarding judgment i can see him wanting to know what was in it even though he wrote it and and i, I hope this doesn't sound too confusing to you folks I, it's not my intention to, to muddy the waters here you know if you think people that aren't interested in this all you got to do is start a prophecy channel on youtube and you'll be overwhelmed by tens of thousands of followers you know or start a, a seminar someplace and you'll you know, so it's not unusual that John wants to know what this book says, but I'm going to suggest that at the time of the vision, John did not know what the scroll said, okay? Yet in writing the book of Revelation, he then did know what it said, as do we who have the book of Revelation. And now we see that it's one of the elders that said to John, don't weep, not an angel, not even God, but it was an elder. Why an elder? And in my mind, that, that just seems to make the most sense. Elders teach. An elder was a man like John. John could relate to that elder. One of his kind, we, we might say. You know, I mean, perhaps it was one John knew, though the text doesn't really say. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed, that is, overcome to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Overcome, same word used for us, overcoming. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is an Old Testament quotation from Genesis. Uh, the Root of David is from Isaiah. And both of those refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. He has prevailed. Overcome is the word. Same word that's used for us, overcoming. And I find that interesting. So he can open the book. And he can loose the seals. And what that text is saying, I believe, is until the, 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 the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it may be saying several things, until, until the, uh, 
until the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's prophetic judgment on Israel and the nations of, of this earth could not begin. Okay? Couldn't happen. It can't happen now because we're still here. There's a lot of Christians out there that do, who disagree with me and say, yeah, the book of Revelation, all the, the judgments can begin to unfold while the church is still here. I, d I believe that the seals are an indication uh, of the fact that it cannot. Couldn't happen. Not until Christ had overcome, and not until the church is, is gone, and that in the context of a lamb, and I could preach, I, you know, anyone, and I believe anyone, one of us could preach a long sermon on that, uh, how that only he's worthy. Well, I'm out of time. I just want to thank you all for all of your wonderful comments that you leave, all of your, your love, your prayers, your support. I wish every one of you a very blessed Christmas. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.